Yeah. All right, everybody. Apologies for the for the change in schedule on Friday. Um, I was just not going to be able to get through a whole lecture without stopping to cough every five minutes. I thought nobody wanted me to be here for that. Um, so hopefully you took the opportunity to get some get some stuff turned in, um, which is great. I'm going to start giving you grades on that stuff eventually. Um, I always prioritize the quizzes when it comes to getting your feedback. So some of your other assignments might uh, take a while for me to get through grading all of them. Um, just so you're not worried about it, if you submitted an assignment and it doesn't have a grade, um, if it if it just has hyphens dashes, that just means I haven't graded it yet. It's not as it's not part of your overall grade for the class yet. If you see a zero show up, that means that I graded that assignment for the whole class and I don't have it for you. Um, and that and then it is in your grade and affecting things. So if you think you turned in an assignment that you have a zero for. Talk to me because we're not, you know, there's a miscommunication somewhere. Um, it's either still in your backpack or you handed it to me on paper and it's in my backpack. Um, something's wrong there. But if you just see dashes, that just means I'm behind, which is normal. Um, Random, I have not finished grading this week's quizzes yet, but I did go through and look at all the quiz questions to see if there's um, some that are relevant. Um, Y'all have a lot of good questions about astronomy and the universe at large and consciousness. Those are all kind of big picture things. I do love talking about them though. Um, but just for, so somebody brought up, I, I mentioned that when you mix salt and ice that you get the temp temperature drops. Um, and it's not really that the temperature drops, it's more that the melting point of ice drops when you mix it, a solution with um, ice and water, you wind up getting the temperature dropping and that's based on basically you've added extra attractive forces between the, the water molecules that cause them to stay in the liquid phase longer. It's harder to get them to crystallize out because when they, when it begins to crystallize, you don't have as favorable of interactions with those salt ions anymore. Uh, more on that when we get to talking about solutions more. Um, any of you who are looking at going into career of medicine, how does chemistry related to medicine? Well, modern medicine is based, is founded on biochemistry. The understanding how small molecules interact with the body to, to alter or adjust or um, assist certain processes. That's all modern medicine is, is picking the right medications for the most part. And those medications and understanding how those medications are shaped and how they interact with your with the enzymes and processes in your body, that's a huge part of, of modern medicine. It's directly chemistry based. Um, antimatter, we'll talk about more when we talk about nuclear reactions. Turns out antimatter is really not to be confused with dark matter, that's a different thing. Antimatter is literally matter that has all the same properties as the matter we're used to, except the charges are flipped on all the subatomic particles. So protons have a negative charge and electrons have a positive charge. Um, but other than that, all of the standard laws of physics are the same. But if you have one particle that has an electron with a positive charge running into an electron with a negative charge, turns out they basically cancel each other out and add up to zero and their mass gets converted into pure energy. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that happen with antimatter, um, but it, we are, we'll, and we'll spend more time on that when we get to nuclear reactions, um, because it really is all related to uh, one, probably the single most famous science equation in the world. In chemistry, we throw the deltas in front of it because we're looking at reactions where something is changing and the change in mass will give off an amount of energy just like burning sugar does. 
just like and just like putting something hot into cold water does. What are you looking for? Stuart here. Stuart here. I'm sorry. Thank no you problem. So much. Um. So we'll actually get to use E equals M C squared and explain what it means and how it works and why things like nuclear bombs have so much energy, but that's not going to be till after midterm. So more details to follow. Um, two questions about gravity and black holes. Black holes are really cool. And it's not really that the laws of physics stop working so much as time stops existing. On the surface of a black hole, the, a black hole is so massive that it actually, it doesn't quite rip the fabric of space and time. That's kind of like more of a sci-fi way of phrasing it. But it's so massive that causality ceases, meaning cause and effect doesn't exist because time stops existing. If you don't have a before and an after, how can you have a cause and effect? If you don't have cause and effect, then everything behaves in a very weird way, in a way that our brains aren't quite capable of comprehending. Um, and so the easier way to, to phrase it is this physics stops working. It's not truly what's happening, but it's getting close. Um, last, why does mass have gravity in general? Well, now we're getting into just that's the way the universe works. Um, the, the, the answer that's not really an answer is because of the Higgs boson. Um, but that doesn't really answer anything. Because why does the Higgs boson cause mass to have gravity? And the, the more true answer is just that that's the way the observable universe works to the best of our knowledge. We haven't found any case where that's not the way things are. Um, so, and that's going to be one of the few cases where I have to you. That's just because, because it is, because it does. There's not really an answer um, that I'm aware of, but then again, I'm not a theoretical physicist. So um, other people might have better answers than me. Ask your physics instructor. Is anybody, is anybody taking the college physics right now? Next Not till next term. Jamie's a perfect person to ask about that. Um, lastly, how does consciousness work? I really like this one because it lets me talk about emergent properties. And it turns out a lot of things about energy and chemistry are emergent properties. Does anybody know what an emergent property is? It's when something when something kind of unexpected or difficult to predict happens as a result of lots and lots of small interactions or small changes. So emergent property might be something like, like a solid existing in the first place. Solids only exist because you have lots and lots of tiny attractive forces between individual atoms or molecules. And when you get enough of those put together, you get something that's much larger than the original than the original pieces. Um, consciousness kind of works like that. It's sort of emergent properties of working upon emergent properties because life is an emergent property. You start with just a bunch of random particles and molecules and give them enough time, they tend to arrange themselves in certain ways that replicate. Uh, and if you do that enough, you wind up with things arranging themselves into an inside and an outside, which is what we call a cell membrane. And so eventually, if you just start with raw matter, it eventually winds up turning into something that looks like a cell. That's an emergent property. If you take enough of those cells and put them together, you get another emergent property, which is be something like a nervous system, where you have individual organs. And if you take enough of those, that nervous system and enough of those neurons and put them together, you get a third emergent property, which is what we call consciousness which is basically matter's ability to understand and think about the matter around it. Or another way, the psychology way of putting it is consciousness is uh, self's understanding of, of how, we, how a being is both part of and apart from uh, its surroundings. So understanding that you are both part of the world and your own object, your own human, is what makes some give something consciousness. Um, and it's the result of all these other layers of emergent properties. Um, 
And it's basically, how does it, how does it work? Well, we don't really know a lot of that. We can put together certain pieces of it, certain chemicals affect the way we think, certain gen genes and genetic traits affect the way we think how our consciousness works. Um, but it's really difficult because consciousness is also sort of a spectrum. Anything with the nervous system could be thought of as being slightly conscious, at least. But then where do you draw lines is what's truly conscious along the way. And it gets really, really interesting. That's why neuroscience is such a, a field that's blowing up right now. Neurology and neuroscience um, are both really, really big fields um, to go into. Lots of really interesting research is happening in those areas. More relevant stuff. What's the best way to start a difficult problem if I don't understand how to do it? If you don't understand how to do it, how do you know how to do it? Yeah, you don't, not yet. But how do you know how to put puzzle pieces of a puzzle together if you don't know how to put the pieces of a puzzle together? Try. Trial and error. Trial and error is not a bad way to do it. You see what fits together. You start putting together, writing out this. I know a lot of you have been taught when you see, do word problems, you just start by writing out everything that's in the problem, right? Um, that's not a bad way to do it, but you can also start thinking about it in terms of what tools do I have in my toolbox for solving word problems that, that I might have to use. Is this going to be a problem that's, where it's going to be, depend a lot on conversions? Is it going to depend on geometry? If the question asks, like the black hole question had some geometry pieces to it, right? How did you know that? Because it used words like radius and then asked you about volumes. Right? If you know if you're given a radius and then it asks you a question about volume, then you know you're going to have to do some geometry in there, right? So part of it is, is reading the context clues in the problem to start saying, okay, what type of problem is this going to be? Is this going to be conversions? Is it going to be conversions and geometry? Is this going to be system of equations? Speaking of, how did that um, copper and lead problem go? 2,000% error. 2,000% error? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't mean the specific E one. I meant the um, the word problem. Oh, the challenge question. The challenge oh, question. Long. Long long. Long. Once you can write the equations out, then it, then it became a whole bunch of algebra steps, right? And this is also okay. where it's helpful to say that yeah. this is a really useful mathematical step when you're showing your work in this class. You just write this out. You can write out system of equations, four equations, four unknowns, and then you just say, I plugged it into a solver and it gave me x equals this. If you wrote those four equations properly, this is a valid math step in this class. This is not an algebra class. I expect that you understand how algebra works, but you don't need to go through three pages of substitutions necessarily if you'd rather learn how to use the solver. The trick with the solver is you got to set it up right. So a calculator that has a solver, I like Wolfram Alpha, which is kind of looks like a, a search engine, um, but it um, but it does math for you as well. Um, it's a great way to test your to uh, check your answers on your calculus and pre-calc questions because it'll also take derivatives, do integrals. Um, in this case, you basically you just have to write out your equations so that you use four different letters as your variables. So what were the four equations for that problem? It was a like mass of copper plus mass of lead equals, was it 4,000 grams, right? Or times 10 to the three grams. Then we had volume, right? Does anybody have this? I want you to be able to look at yours. Is it 427 cubic centimeters? Yeah. And then what were the other two equations that we had to use? Math is 4,300 grams. So we have four unknowns here, right? All we started answering this problem just by saying, okay, well, I know the total mass is the mass of copper plus the mass of lead, right? I can do the same thing for volume. 
I only have two algebra equations that don't seem all that useful. How do we connect them? What else do we know about the copper and the lead? This not ring, is this ring any bells? How many of you did this problem? Okay, the densities. The densities are the way to relate masses and volumes, right? So when, you have, when you're doing a system of equations problem, when you're writing multiple algebra equations and you're gonna try and solve them to get an answer, to get a value for one of them, you need as many equations as you have variables, as you have unknowns, right? So in this case, we have four unknowns, so we need a total of four equations. And the densities are going to be equations three and four, because we can say with 8.91, or just 8.9, and 11.34, I think grams per cubic centimeter. here. <clears throat> This was the density of copper, right? So that's going to be mass of copper over volume of copper. This is the density of lead. So mass of lead over volume of lead. I just added two new equations. They're just things we already knew, but I wrote them out mathematically in a way that uses the same variables we used up here, right? Now we have four equations with four unknowns. This is the point where you could say, and start it, instead of doing, sub, substitution will always work. You can, if you have a system of equations like this, you can always just start, solve for one of your variables, plug it into one of your other equations. Repeat until you're, you're done to, down to only one variable. Once you're down to only one variable, get a number for it, and then you can solve for the rest of them. That's the, the longhand way of doing it, the brute force way of doing it. We take those same equations and we write them in here. I'm going to redefine my variables. Mass of copper equals M. Mass of lead equals N. Volume of copper equals X. And volume of lead equals Y. Just for the sake of putting it into the into the um, solver. That's going to make our life easier to redefine these variables in terms of something that's just a single letter. And so we can write M plus N equals, what was it? 4360, comma, X plus Y equals 427, comma, 8.9 equals M over X. 11.34 equals N over Y. Solve for M. And if you, it'll also show you your equations. So make sure that you input them right so that they all look right. M plus N is 4360. X plus Y is 427. 8.9 is M over X. 11.34 is N over Y. Solve for M. And it gives you the exact answer of all of those. M is 1758. N is 2601. So if you wrote your equations out properly, really the trick here, what I'm most interested in is can we set, learn to set up the problems properly? If you set up your equations, I don't care if you do it by hand, or if you use a solver like Wolfram Alpha, or if you use your calculator. Um, a lot of times what I would do to avoid having to type that or making mistakes there is I'd do some of the easy substitutions get it down to two equations, two unknowns. And as soon as the substitutions start looking really obnoxious, um, then I would find a solver. Um, but you can just start it just from right here. You should get, I don't know those, the same answers. Go ahead, who got an answer for the mass of copper? One, seven, five, three. 
pretty close. It's probably rounding difference somewhere in the in the substitutions when you were doing all the substitutions. Um, we won't lose points for using a solver. You will not. And I'm not going to ask ask you to do a system of equations on an in class test. The take home test, yeah. There's the take home final has a system of equations problem on it, but this is a valid step that you won't lose points for in this class. Ask your teacher. For classes that are more that are more about showing that you know how to do the substitutions, this doesn't work because they actually want you to show that you know how to do the do it longhand, right? Um, but for this class, that's totally fine. And most TI-89s have a solver that will be able to do this. Um, there's a couple other options. I think Desmos is a free solver online. I like Wolfram Alpha because the user interface works really well. Um, it's really easy to input stuff. Um, and it'll also do things like integration. So if you, or taking a derivative. So you can check your answer on some of your math homework. Um, don't just put your math homework excuse me, put your math homework in there and then write it because obviously that's cheating, right? But checking your answers when you've already done the work, I guess ask your, your teacher if, you, if they're okay with you doing that. But I, don't, I think most teachers would be okay with that. If they're not, they probably have a very specific reason. Are you? Um, a lot of us actually like questions on the table. One of them, it asked for it in joules, but then, um, but then the answer was in kilojoules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's my mistake. Okay, Sorry. I want to make sure I was doing it wrong. I'll put all under seven thousand. Anytime you get this, the right numbers, but the wrong decimal point, that's either either you forgot a conversion or I did. Okay. Um, in this case, I asked for it in joules, but then I I wrote the answer in kilojoules. I did not get to it. And I was like, no. Um, I was like, yeah, I'll go back through later to probably tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, and do the scores for those. For all of the quizzes, too, you guys haven't had have a quiz yet that's been graded. Auto grader for Canvas is pretty garbage. Um, and so in general, I put the answers in there so that you can see what you should have gotten. Don't look at the points. It doesn't assign partial credit. It, there's lots of ways you could write the correct answer um, that aren't the way that I input the right answer. So you. For a lot of those, you'll get full credit, even though it says zero points on Canvas. Canvas doesn't do partial credit. So don't panic about that. Um, I'll go back through and finish grading those, and your, your scores will look a lot better there. Um, and to go along with the theme of Canvas, Canvas's quizzes can be a, a pile of hot garbage sometimes. Um, why can they not put units on the quiz? Because I I consistently try to give Canvas a chance to prove itself, um, and it always does it poorly. So the putting the numerical answers in does not allow you to also put in units. So if I'm going to have an auto grader that actually shows you the right answer as a number, then it does it won't let me use units um, when I put that in there. I don't think I'm going to use that very much because I'll just go into write it like it's text, um, and then just know that. That when they, the answer shows up, if you wrote, if you put a space in the wrong place, it'll show up as having the wrong answer. Like if you put, um, you know, one hundred and thirty-seven thousand space joules, and I did not put the space there, and I just put one hundred and thirty-seven thousand joules, it would mark your answer as wrong when it's obviously correct. Um, so when it gives you the option, write the units. It is important. I think I'm going to just go back to that. Just know. That the auto grader is going to show it as being a wrong answer, but as long as it looks like the same thing I have written, it's at least mostly a correct answer. So don't second guess yourself on that too much. Um, and then some questions about the quiz or the uh, lab. How do we do? How do we get a more accurate answer? Well, one, there were a lot of places where that lab could kind of fell apart, right? Um, we made some assumptions in that lab that might not be great assumptions. Can anybody think of some, a place where we might have had a source of error? Yes. Yeah, the, the period of time between when you took the copper out of the hot water and then dumped it into the cold water, it lost some energy along the way, right? So that's definitely a source of error. It wasn't a perfectly 
can, uh, perfectly closed system, right? And plus, the, the cup itself had to heat up too, right? We assumed that the only thing we were heating up was the water in our calorimeters, right? We had to heat up the cup itself too, right? So there's a lot of places where we can we could do a better job of taking some of those other numbers into account and to get better numbers. And the other way we do it is just by doing it, instead of doing it two or three times and averaging the answers, if you did it, say, 100 times, and averaged all the numbers, you could have a lot more say things and be a lot closer. Um, but there were a lot of a lot of room places where you could have messed up and, and where there's room for improvement. Um, the main thing for this lab wasn't getting the right answer; it was understanding the process and how the, what the assumptions were in terms of water warms up. We can calculate Q. If we can calculate Q. We can calculate CP. Understanding the process was the most important thing, um, which we we frequently see lab chemistry labs like that because there's a lot of um, a lot of well that's good enough it's going to be within sig figs types assumptions that we make in these labs um, just so we can do some of these experiments. Um, negatives when it comes to heat, basically. If something comes out with a negative value for Q, that just means its temperature decreased because the mass can't be negative. If you look at the pieces of Q, if Q is negative, one of these three has to be negative, right? Mass can't be negative. You can't have a negative grams, right? Specific heat worth thinking about but I did, I did specifically say last week, specific heat should never be negative, which means if Q is negative, the only thing, the only reason it could be negative mathematically is because your delta T was negative, your temperature dropped. And if your temperature dropped, that means the object lost energy, right? If it lost energy, that energy had to go somewhere else. So a lot of times with these, I don't pay too much attention to the negative because I'm more interested in energy absorbed or energy released, right? So you could say negative 173 kilojoules, or you could see, say 173 kilojoules lost or released. Those mean the same thing. We're just using a qualitative object or not a qualitative term a a value word almost instead of using a negative sign but it means the same thing um a lot of times this negative sign just depends on what's your frame of reference and that can be it's a lot of times it's more helpful to talk about it in, in words like this than it is to just use the negative sign because using these words like this are going to be how you understand what's actually going on. The negative sign, you can misinterpret that a lot easier, in my experience. All right, other questions about the quiz? Or sorry, about the lab? About anything? OK. Last thing before we get into talking about phase change. <clears throat> um, how does this apply to astronomers? How do we, does this apply to the universe at large? Do we know that the laws of physics are the same on other planets as they are? No, no but we don't see anything that says otherwise. We have no reason to think that they're not the same. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of the same concepts that we'll use here get applied when you're talking about astronomy, um, they do. We do talk about things like um, talk about the specific heat of different materials on Mars. And Mars is mostly made of iron oxide, not of silicon dioxide. Most of the Earth's mass is silicon dioxide. Most of Mars's mass is iron oxide. That means that Mars, as a whole, has a different specific heat as an entire planet than Earth does 
which is going to change some things about weather. It's going to change some things about atmosphere. Um, it's one of the reasons why it's thought that that uh, Mars lost its tectonic activity before Earth did. Earth still has tectonic activity. Mars doesn't anymore. Mars doesn't have a molten core anymore. Part of the reason for that is that Mars is made of different stuff than Earth is, which means you're going to have some different properties. So if we make the assumption that physics is probably more or less the same throughout the universe, at least within our solar system, then we can we can apply a lot of the same concepts we'll talk about here just in other contexts on other planets. Um, and because I like talking about space too, I do tend to bring up things where you know we'll we'll have a bunch of different um, concepts where like, well, we have this set up based on Earth, but the same concept applies a little differently if we're on a different planet. If we're on a planet where the dominant or the most common liquid wasn't water, we wouldn't have a pH scale that went from zero to 14. There's lots of planets or lots of uh, moons around J Saturn and Jupiter that have liquids that are not water as their dominant liquid. So they don't have a pH scale that's based around water or they wouldn't. If we did chemistry there, we would use a different pH scale. Um, so I, I like to talk about stuff like that too. So when something like that comes up, I'm always happy to stop and talk about the astronomy side of it too. Astronomy is cool. All right. Let's talk some more about energy. <clears throat> and when we're talking about phase changes, all of our energies that we've talked about so far dealt with things that were staying the same phase. If we started with, with uh, a liquid with liquid water, it stayed liquid water. But the thing is, is that's not really what happens. If you if you took that uh, that quiz problem, the you know 400 Celsius piece of metal, and you dropped it in water, you're not just going to see the water changing temperature. You're also going to see what. Yeah, the, well, the metal changing temperature, but I was more thinking about the water is also going to evaporate too, right? Evaporation is a phase change. And if you have a phase change happening, you're going from one of those low energy phases to a higher energy phase. Go back to our concert analogy, right? It takes energy to go from a sign seating at a motorhead show to a mosh pit at a motorhead show, right? The energy that you have to put in to get it to change phases has a calorie or joule value associated with it. And so we call that the heat. And so there's a few different terms here, heat, heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, or heat of sublimation. And a lot of times we use the, the symbol we use is delta H. So heat of fusion, we'll write it as delta H of fusion. Um, not to be, this is not fusion like nuclear fusion. Fusion is the physics term for freezing. When something goes from a, from a liquid to a solid, they call that fusion. Confusing, I don't, I know, but that's, that's what we're working with here. Um, and this H is actually, it's not H for heat. It's actually H for an energy term called enthalpy. Well, obviously, because enthalpy starts with H, makes sense, right? Just like heat starts with Q. Um, enthalpy is basically how much energy is in the attractive forces holding the molecules together. And so when you change phases, you change whether it's everything is locked into a solid versus be able to move around as a liquid. You have to put energy in to get that phase change to happen. That amount of energy is the change in enthalpy for that phase change. All right, and then, um, so the other, the other versions of delta H of vaporization is the energy of evaporation. Of vaporization is just another word for evaporation, right? For whatever reason, freezing and evaporation, we tend to associate entirely or 
explicitly with water, implicitly with water. Um, so vaporization just applies to any substance, not just water. Infusion applies to any substance, not just water. Technically, you're not wrong to say that melted iron could freeze to become solid iron, um, but freezing also has other, other, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, connotations, thank you. Uh, so, and then sublimation. What is sublimation? We talked about that one yet? Straight from a solid to a gas. Straight from a solid to a gas. And so if you can go straight from a solid to a gas, you have to take all the energy that you would normally get, have to put into it to get it to melt, and then to get it to evaporate, you have to put it all in at once. Um, how do we calculate this? Well, a lot of times, looking at the units on these delta H values is going to be really key. 334 joules per gram is the enthalpy of fusion for water. What does that mean? Any guesses? Joules. Yeah, 334 joules per gram is the enthalpy of fusion for water. What does joules per gram mean? Jesse? Well, so that'd be the specific heat. So the specific heat, and again, <clears throat> we're using the word heat all over the place, right? It's really confusing. We're not looking necessarily at a temperature change. This is a phase change now. So there's no, that's why there's not joules per gram degree Celsius. It's just joules per gram. So what this me actually means is if you're going to melt one gram of ice at zero Celsius and turn it into one gram of water at zero Celsius, you have to put in 334 joules. So that seems like kind of a big number considering the numbers of joules we were dealing with last week, right? 334 joules is, is a lot considering water has a specific heat of 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius, it takes a lot more energy to melt ice than it does to, to heat up cold water, which sound, seems backwards, but we'll actually see some examples of this. Maybe that would be a good lab if we're, if we're behind next week. Maybe we could do a phase change lab where we have them watch, watch water melt or watch ice melt. Um, it's literally what the lab is, but then you measure some stuff too. Yeah. Um, so here's an example. You add 15 grams of ice to a glass of warm uh, room temperature water. How much energy does it take to convert all of the ice to water? Well, you know how many grams you have, right? We did some practice problems where we used density as a conversion, didn't we? And where we or where we used um, speed as a conversion. This works the same way. It's another combined unit, just like density. So if you've got 15 grams of ice and one gram of ice takes 334 joules absorbed. Grams cancels grams, we're just left in joules. So this is actually easier. It's a weirder concept to get your head used to, but the math is actually easier than using the Q equation. 15 times 334. So we should get something like 4,800 or so. Uh, 5,010? Yeah. How many sig figs do we keep here? Three. <coughs> so either put it in scientific notation or put it in kilojoules.
let's do the calorimetry step. If all of that energy came from the warm water. Let's say our mass of warm water is, it's a good amount. Um, let's say it's a pint glass. So let's say it's 534 milliliters. What's the temperature change of the water? Of the warm water? Well, we know how much energy got absorbed from the warm water, right? Five kilojoules. So we know Q. And that's energy lost. So we throw a negative sign in there. What's the specific heat of water? Four point one eight four, right? So what assumption are we making in order to do this? We're assuming, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> we're assuming that all of the energy that melted the ice came from the warm water. In other words, just like with the, with the hot metal versus the cold water before, where we said Q1 is equal to negative Q2, right? We're doing the same thing here. When we plug it in, get something like 5.01, 10 to the two joules equals 534 grams, 4.184 joules, gram degree Celsius, delta T, solve for delta T. Did I miss something? Thank you. Just a typo. I did it way back here. So 5,000 divided by 500 is going to be about 10 divided by another four, something in the two degrees range. Single digits, I would say, for delta T just with my mental arithmetic. Yeah, probably pretty close to two. Nobody's gonna correct me? Two point two, two point two four. All right, so that's not relevant to the question that's on the screen. I just wanted more practice for us with us using Q. And remember to separate it out into two systems. We have the ice that's absorbing the energy, the warm water, or sorry, that's providing the energy, is losing energy. If we want to know what a temperature change is going to be, anytime there's a temperature change, you should be using your Q equation. Which ties into the next point. Well, there was more problems there. What happens to the temperature when you hit a phase change? Seems like it should increase. Turns out actually when you actually have a system that's undergoing a phase change, it'll actually stay at a constant temperature which seems like that doesn't make sense. But then think about boiling water. What happens when you get your, your water boiling and keep the heat on it? 
it keeps boiling. It doesn't get hotter than that, does it? It stays at 100 Celsius, right? Or up here in the mountains, about 94 Celsius. Why is that? Because when you get to the point where the water starts boiling, all the extra energy that you're putting in is not changing the temperature, it's just going to the phase change. Basically, at atmospheric pressure, you can't have water above a certain temperature as a liquid. So when you try to heat it past a certain temperature, it just evaporates instead. Once it's all evaporated, then you can continue to warm it up. Once you're done with the phase change, temperature will continue to change. But at the point of a phase change, everything stays the same temperature, which is why we use ice to cool down drinks, why we use boiling as a really convenient way to cook things, because you really can't burn something if you're just boiling water. And you, it's pretty easy to burn, like, I don't know, broccoli. You can roast broccoli in the oven. It tastes really, really good. It's also really easy to burn it. It's really hard to burn broccoli if you put it into boiling water, unless you just straight up run out of water. You put on your boil your broccoli to boil, and then you go, you know, I don't know, go read a book or something for a while, and you come back and all your water's gone. Then it can, you can burn it. But until you run out of water, everything's going to stay at 100 Celsius, so you can't burn your food really which is also why it takes longer to cook food up here because our boiling point is not as high, right? It doesn't seem like it's a big difference, 94 Celsius to 100 Celsius. Um, but it actually, when we start talking about reaction rates in GenCam, um, it turns out a small change in temperature. The effect of temperature and a reaction rate is actually exponential. So a small change in um, a small change in the temperature is going to have a really big impact on the rate of a reaction. Boxed pasta is a really good example of that up here. It takes way longer to cook boxed pasta up here than it does at sea level. Say two, if it says 12 minutes on the box, we know it's really going to be more like 15, 16, 18 minutes. Um, Kraft macaroni and cheese does a pretty good job. And at, when I was a high schooler, that was about the extent of my cooking experience. Um, but even Kraft macaroni and cheese would still be a little al dente at 12 minutes. If you cooked it 12 minutes at sea level, it would be overdone by pasta standards. All right, so how do we calculate all these energies? Well, we just did an example. If you have the delta H of fusion, all you have to do is you figure out how much of your, your substance is going to go through a phase change, and you just do that one-step conversion. All right, so let's do a three-step problem. So this, let me go back. This graph over here is called a... a heating curve or a cooling curve, depending on which way it's going. It's always going to look the same for water. Sometimes just the, the direction is backwards. If you start from, well, basically what it's, what it's actually showing is as you remove energy from steam, it cools down until you get to the condensation point, which is the same as the boiling point. Once you get to the boiling point, when you if you keep removing heat from it, if you keep removing energy from that water, it condenses and you get liquid water at the same temperature. So at the beginning of this horizontal section, at that point right here, we had steam at 100 Celsius. Here, we have the same number of grams of liquid water at 100 Celsius. No temperature change between the two. So these horizontal sections on this graph are showing you the phase changes. 
what temperature you can expect to see them. And down here, this would be zero Celsius. So what do we have at that point that I just circled? What does the system look like? It's zero degrees. What phase is it in? I heard water and ice. I heard solid. It's not solid till we finish this step. Here, it's still at zero Celsius, but it's solid. So what is it at the beginning of that phase change? Liquid. This, the rest of this point along this horizontal line, it's not truly horizontal, but forgive me my poor art skills. Every other point along here, you have a mixture of water and ice. Initially, it's just water at zero Celsius, mixture of water and ice. Now it's just ice at zero Celsius, and then it can continue getting colder. All right, so these heating curves or cooling curves are useful because they allow us to plan out what's happening, to actually diagram what's happening, what calculations we need to do. So let's say we start at negative 23 Celsius. That's normal freezer temperature. If you start with 25 grams of ice at negative 23 Celsius, how much energy is it gonna to take to bring that ice up to the melting point? We have two tools, two types of calculations we've done with energy so far, right? Ones that involve a temperature change and the ones that don't. Does this involve a temperature change? So what are we going to be using? Q equals mass specific heat delta T. We know everything except for Q, right? I'm actually going to erase this and I'm going to rearrange it to start from cold and work the other direction. So we're starting at negative 23 Celsius. We're going to warm it up till we get to zero Celsius. We'll call that Q1. Calculating Q1 is as simple as knowing the mass. Double check your specific heat because specific heat of ice is not the same as the specific heat of liquid water but it's given to you. So mass is 25 grams, CP 2.11 joules per gram degree Celsius. What's delta T? Twenty-three. Final minus initial, so zero minus negative twenty-three. It went from negative 23 to zero. So <clears throat> then it's just plug and chug, right? We've done a bunch of those calculations. Don't even need to rearrange it if we're solving for Q. It's already solved for Q. What happens if we keep warming it up? What happens when it hits zero Celsius? It melts, right? So on our heating curve, we get a horizontal section. That's going to have its own Q value. It takes a different amount of energy to melt the ice as it did to warm up the ice. How much energy is it going to take to melt the ice? Well, we've got joules per gram and we've got grams, right? We did it with 15 grams before. <laughs> grams cancels grams. All, we're, all we need is our delta H effusion. Except delta H effusion was for freezing, right? 
going from a liquid to a solid, can we use it for melting as well? I see some heads shaking, some heads nodding. Somebody who is nodding their head yes. Why can we use the same number for melting as freezing? It's the same but in reverse, right? All that changed is the sign. It's either energy absorbed or energy released. If ice is melting, are we putting energy into it or taking energy out of it? You gotta put energy into it, right? So we can put a absorbed to indicate that the energy is going into the ice. Yeah, for all of these delta H values, the, they have the same value with the opposite sign for going backwards. So there's a delta H of vaporization. Condensation is going to have the same number, but with a, with a negative sign attached to it. Turns out it takes just as much energy to boil water as it gives off when it condenses. So then we get we get what uh, it was five thousand before. Now we have ten more grams. There we go. Three fifty. We'll put it in kilojoules so I don't have an ambiguous number there. We'll show our work for that conversion too, just for the sake of I was showing all those conversion steps. If we keep heating it up. Once all the ice is gone, temperature starts changing again, right? Think about everyday life. You start with something totally frozen, the ice cube out of the freezer. It starts by staying solid and warming up, then it melts. And then if you still leave it there after it's all the way melted, it's going to wind up at room temperature, right? About 21 Celsius. How do we calculate Q3? Same thing we did here, right? Q1 and Q3 are going to both be the same process. The only thing that changes is now we're liquid water, so we use the other CP, and we have a different delta T. But we're still just using our Q equation, right? So it's still 25.0 grams. Now it's 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, and delta T is 21 degrees Celsius. So something around two kilojoules, 2,000-ish. Or for our sig figs, 2.20 kilojoules. So which step out of all three of these, which step actually took the most energy? I guess what was Q1? What was the final answer as a number for Q1? A little louder. I heard a number. 25 times 2 is about 50 times 23. Going to give us something. So out of all three of our steps, all three of our different processes that happened, 1.2 kilojoules for Q1. 8 kilojoules for Q2, 2 kilojoules for Q3. 
Q2 took the most by a long shot, right? It took Q3 was going from water at zero Celsius to water at room temperature. So out of that process, it took four times as much energy to melt the ice as it did to warm the cold water up to room temperature. Phase change has a lot of energy associated with it. Again, this is one of the reasons why ice is, is really useful for cooling down drinks. Um, again, a lot of my bartending analogies or examples are probably less, hopefully less useful to you as teenagers. Um, but with my college students, if, this is why if you go to a restaurant and the server gets you a, glass, a soda that's filled to the brim with ice, they're not actually trying to shorten you on your soda. They're actually just trying to make sure that they, you don't have warm soda that they have to come back and replace in 10 minutes. Because if they just put a couple of ice cubes in there, it's going to melt really quickly, right? You have a whole cup full of ice and you fill it with soda, it's going to stay cold for your entire meal. I mean, and actually, frankly, if you think about it, I almost guarantee you that soda is cheaper than the energy cost of the ice. So it's not actually about saving money. Soda is real cheap. Electricity is not. The energy that they, they spend, the amount they spend on making the ice is probably more than what they would be out if they just filled your, your glass to the top with soda. All right. This is the same example we just did <clears throat> with different numbers. So if you want another problem like that, where you have to draw the heating curve yourself, you have a piece of ice at negative 23 going up to room temperature at 22, and it has a mass of 35. Pretty easy to go through the same process, just with different mass but your delta H of vapor of fusion is the same. Your heat capacities are, or your specific heats are the same. Here's an example of some heating curves. At Lake Tahoe's elevation, water boils around 94 Celsius. A sample of ice at zero Celsius is heated until it melts and becomes steam at 94 Celsius. So we have a whole process in there, right? Sample of ice at zero Celsius and it, we're going until it becomes entirely steam at 94 Celsius. What is that heating curve going to look like? B? Well, how many phase changes do we have in this description? We start as ice at zero Celsius. What has to happen to get it to steam at 94 Celsius? What's the first thing that's going to happen if you start adding energy into ice at zero Celsius? It's going to start melting. It's not going to start warming up yet. Not till all the ice is gone. It, and that's a point that I want to make. We are making the assumption that this is perfectly mixed and everything is behaving in a perfect world. Because really, yeah, the, the water starts melting, or the ice starts melting and the water starts heating up kind of simultaneously, right? As soon as it starts melting, you get a little bit of the water that start warming up a little bit too. If you had perfect mixing, that wouldn't be the case. If it was perfectly mixed, it would stay at zero Celsius until all the ice was gone. At which point, what happens? Now our temperature can start changing, right? Yeah. Temperature is going to go up until it hits what? So it's, yeah, it's liquid this whole time. Solid to liquid. Temperature change from zero up to 94. If we were at sea level, it'd be going all the way until it hits 100, right? Our boiling point is at 94 Celsius. And once it's 94 Celsius, what does it do? Boils. And then when it's done boiling,
So B and C, what's the difference between B and C? B kept keeps going. B is if you kept heating the steam after it was all evaporated. If you stop once it's all steam at 94 Celsius, it's going to look like this. So somewhat arbitrary, but it's basically, it's a multiple choice question, right? So eliminate the ones you know can't be true, which got us down to B and C, just by looking at the starting point, right? And then out of those, you just had to pick which one best matches what's described. So you just look at your start point and your end point. What's going to change if it's not water? The heat it takes, how long these lot, these phase changes are. If, we're, if I'm drawing this to scale, the x-axis is the amount of joules we're putting in to get it to, to warm up or melt, right? If we change what the substance is, it's going to have a different delta H effusion. And it's going to have a different specific heat which means the slope is going to change here. What else is going to change? The amount of heat's going to change. The slope's going to change. Bingo. Our boiling point is going to be different, and our freezing point is going to be different. Ethanol, for instance, freezes at about negative 70 Celsius, and it boils at 78 Celsius. So that's going to have a much longer region where it's liquid and your phase changes are going to be at different intervals. But the same overall shape is going to be true for everything. Everything has a heating curve that looks more or less the same. The only thing that's different is where do you see the phase changes? And on terms of the Y value, and what are the slope and the lengths of these lines look like? It's always going to be Warm up, phase change, warm up, phase change, warm up. All right, 10 minutes. Normally this would be a time where I would just say we should, we should just end it there because that's a convenient place to stop, except we need to make, make up for lost time. So, you're going to see this twice. I will go over it more quickly on Wednesday. Um, but we're going to talk about atomic theory a little bit more. Actually, this is already your second time seeing this, right? We talked about the history of, of atomic theory. Dalton was the one who came up with the idea that we had these tiny in, indestructible particles. And we talked about how we actually need to amend this already. One of the ways that they needed to amend this came almost immediately. Dalton put this put this forward in uh, probably the early 1700s. Ben Franklin was one of, one of the people that did some research that that went into um, revising this, and that would have been before 1800. Because Ben Franklin, I don't think he lived past 1800, did he? Who's taken their American history more recently than me? When did uh, anybody know when Ben Franklin died? It was in the 1800s. It was early because he was already 1790. Thank you. He was already old and during the uh, Constitutional Congress. 84. So it means he was he was in his 70s when he helped write the Constitution. All right. So more. More to the point, though, not Ben Franklin. This was a guy um, named Thompson in Scotland. Came, found a way to measure what he called cathode rays. And what Thompson found is that if you, if you took this, what they call a vacuum tube, which is just a tube of glass that's almost entirely empty, um, if you took two pieces of metal at either end of the, of the vacuum tube, you applied a voltage to them, you got these tiny little particles flying from one end of the tube to the other. Um, and there were a couple things they were able to measure about them. They traveled in straight lines. They had a negative charge. They were 2,000 times smaller than hydrogen, which was already known to be the smallest um, element. And they were identical no matter what was used. So are they connected to CRT television? Yes. 
good question. So a cathode ray tube, um, basically by by using a magnetic, if it has a if it naturally travels in a straight line and has a neg mag blah, 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 it has a negative charge, you can influence where it flies by using a magnetic field. So if you apply a magnetic field to this, you can get these little particles to fly in wherever you want in two dimensions. A, a CRT monitor, an old TV, um, they also they used to call them um they they still call them vacuum tubes um but basically it's just that piece of glass with a with a bunch of stuff on the inside that will glow when one of these particles would hit it so you can get a black and white picture just by using magnetic fields to direct where these particles fly and then if you do something um clever and instead of having just a one even film that glows white when it gets hit with one of these particles, you have really, really small dots that will glow either red or green or blue, depending on which of the three dots gets hit, then you get a color TV. Um, so really, really clever engineering, but what are those particles that are flying around? Well, they're smaller than atoms. How does that work? I just didn't I just say that they're tiny indestructible particles and that's the smallest thing that you can have. So basically what we in immediately showed right after coming up with the atomic theory is that it can't be totally true because there's something smaller than atoms. And these are what went on to be called electrons. Basically what Thompson discovered were electrons. So that's actually what a CR an old CRT TV or a monitor would actually do. And why it was actually, they, they used to say um, when I was growing up, don't sit too close to the TV because it'll ruin your eyes. That actually used to be true because not all of the electrons would get captured by, by the screen. And you would actually be firing high energy electrons into your eyes um, if you sat too close to the TV for too long. Or at least that's what they thought. It was a pretty small, insignificant amount. It wasn't actually causing cancer, ruining people's eyes probably, but it wasn't good for you. Um, LED TVs, you don't need to worry about that at all. So it's less of an issue now. Um, but here was the key. Atoms we thought were the smallest pieces, but they're actually made of smaller building blocks. And those smaller building blocks have a name. These are what are called electrons, but just in general, what we're going to talk about on Wednesday are called subatomic particles. So if we know that there's a negative subatomic particle, but atoms are neutral, what else does there have to be? There's got to be something that's positive because they have to add up to be zero if it's going to be neutral, right? So they discovered these little tiny negative particles that they called electrons. Then they said, well, there has to be something else behind that to balance that out. And so um, Thompson's, Thompson's student came, oh, was named Rutherford. Or actually, no, Thompson came up with the plum pudding model. Rutherford. Um, it's trying to prove that the plum pudding model worked. The plum pudding model basically says, okay, you've got these electrons in your atoms just sort of stuck embedded in them. Uh, they called it the plum pudding model after a, what sounds to me to be a pretty gross dessert from England um, called the plum pudding, which is in the US, we call it a fruitcake, um, which is basically just a baked mass of dough, a batter with a bunch of fruit embedded in it. So he said, okay, well, it's like, it's like a plum pudding. You've got the electrons that are just stuck in the cake like, um, like plums in a plum pudding. And if you apply enough voltage, you can get those, negative, those negatively charged electrons to fly out. All right, and so what Rutherford did, Thompson's student who was trying to prove the plum pudding model correct, Rutherford said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a piece of foil, and I'm a gold foil. I'm going to hammer it really, really flat. And I'm going to fire these charged particles called alpha particles at it. These alpha particles 
They knew a few things about them, but there was, he was expecting that they would just pass straight through and just be moving slower when they came out the other side. And what he found was something totally different than what he expected. And we'll talk about what that was on Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> 